Good evening. I'm Alex Moore. I'm a climate and health scientist. I work on the impact of climate change on people's health and the economy and the impact of people on climate and the environment. So I'm not busy at all these days. <laughs> I think if in three years in, if we can all agree on something, we don't want another pandemic, right? Because if we disagree on that, we got bigger problems. Well, how do we figure out when pandemics happen, how do they happen? One way is to look at the past, when they already happened, and look at the context and try to figure it out. And in most cases, this is done in a 50 year, on a 50-year scale, maybe a 100-year scale. I do it on a millennial scale. So if you think about time as a line, going from one to uh, the present, and uh, you divide the time up in periods of warmer and then colder climate due to small natural changes, and then eventually very hot climate change, which is what we're experiencing now due to greenhouse gases that we put into the air, into the atmosphere. It turns out that if you ask the question, when do pandemics happen, they tend to happen at the transition points between these warmer and colder periods. So the first pandemic, 542. The second pandemic, 1347, lasted several centuries. And uh, multiple pandemics of cholera and various other diseases in the 1800s after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And then 1918, the Spanish flu pandemic, the largest pandemic by number of victims. And then uh, COVID. 2020 and beyond. So that's interesting and important. And we are trying to figure out what the parameters are behind it. What, what, what's going on? What is making these things happen at these transition points? And we've been doing this in a collaboration between the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine, the Initiative for the Science of Human Past at Harvard, and UMass Boston for the last decade or so. One of the tools we use is called an ice core, which is a cylinder of ice that we drilled out of a glacier. And uh, if you want to think of it as a time capsule, you can, because that's exactly what it is. It captures everything that's in the atmosphere. And in those layers that you see, the, each of those layers corresponds to a period of time. So we can actually pinpoint those periods of time when pandemics happen and see what was going on in the environment. Ice cores do this very, very well, and uh, the Climate Change Institute really mastered the art and science of uh, drilling these out of glaciers and storing them and analyzing them with next generation laser technology, which I'm not going to talk about tonight, but it's really cool. And one of the things that it that allows us to do also is preserve the ice for the future, because as you know, glaciers are melting. And as they are melting, we're losing a record of climate change because of climate change. And uh, the Climate Change Institute is the only place where we can do this. We can actually preserve the ice forever, even when glaciers are gone. So ice cores capture everything uh, that's in the atmosphere. They capture natural things like oceans evaporating or a volcanic eruption. But they also capture our pollution, and they capture greenhouse gases and temperatures. In fact, one of the things that we found out was that during pandemics, pollution drops. And we did this five years before it actually happened during COVID. I don't know if you remember that, uh, but in March 2020, headlines all over the world, pollution's dropping everywhere, because guess what? We stopped doing all the excess things like commuting that uh, people do to pollute the air and that are killing the planet. We actually found that out five years earlier. We predicted the future by looking at the past that during the second pandemic, uh, for five years, we had the cleanest air in the last 2,000 years. But I wanted to look at a more recent pandemic, the largest pandemic by number of victims, the Spanish flu, which happened right at the end of World War I, 1918. Three waves, the second wave in the fall, or autumn, as they say in Europe, uh, of 1918. So the first thing I did was I looked at what the climate was doing at that time. And we have data pulled from all over the world, from all sorts of science centers from all over the world, in a tool called Climate Reanalyzer, also the Climate Change Institute. It's free for everybody to use. And 
that blob that you see, that scary purple blob showed up right on the second wave of the Spanish flu. And that gave me a clue that something was going on there. I wanted to figure out if that actually was something that was affecting the pandemic. And uh, that blob caused the cold and wet weather we all are familiar with. If you studied any history of the, the war, you know that people lived and fought in these fields of mud and water. They slept in it, they ate in it. Water everywhere. And the fields were also bombed out. As you can see in the background, all the trees are bombed out. And that'll become important in a minute. So we looked at the climate anomaly, we discovered it, and then we looked at the ice core, and the ice core showed that when cold and wet weather spiked in the blue and yellow lines, we also had a spike in mortality. That is how many people died. And that gave me another clue. Maybe we're onto something. Nobody actually knew where the Spanish flu actually came from or how it spread. We know it's an avian virus. It's carried by birds. And by the way, the red line, how many people died, that data was never published. People published about it, but it was never published. For 100 years, I couldn't find anybody that had it. So I had to go in 13 different countries, get the records, translate them, add them up. Yeah, that was uh, uh, pretty gruesome work. <clears throat> but I wasn't satisfied with three records telling me the story because reality is complex and complex problems need complex solutions. And so I found another data set, also a very high resolution. All of this is big data. Week by week, day by day, uh, in fact, uh, rain for the entire period. And then I plotted the victims on top of it. And in the fall of 1918, during the second wave of the Spanish flu, both rain and victims spiked at the same time, the same way, exactly the same week. Well, that gave us a fourth clue that we were in fact onto something. You can see how many data sets, how many records we were looking at, it's a lot. We wanted to know how this rain happened, why did it happen, why did it happen the way it did, and it turns out that because uh, there was this climate anomaly on top of Europe, and we were bombing, for the first time, carpet bombing Europe, unlike ever before, because there were no planes to bomb the, the ground with before, and with artillery, we caused all that soil that you see in the pockmarks still today, all that soil to go in, up in the air in the aerosol. And we saw that in the ice core too. And it turns out that particles of dust work like magnets with cloud droplets and make it rain. That's how artificial rain is actually created. And so in fact, it turns out that a climate anomaly that was already there was made worse by us but we didn't realize that until I published this. And the same climate anomaly also interrupted migration patterns. It not only changed how we were living, but how animals were living. And it turns out those are the migration patterns as you see on the screen. And migration patterns particularly of birds, the carriers of the disease, H1N1, Spanish flu. And it when we asked ecologists, young birds in autumn and fall reach a 60% infection rate of uh, H1N1 virus because their immune system is not strong enough yet to fend it off. And so we had water overflowing everywhere with a concentration of birds that carried the disease. We're doing their business in the water. Once they do that, it lasts two weeks, the water is infected. The water was reaching people in high concentration in the trenches of Europe. And those people who were living in the conditions you see there were also immunocompromised in the sense that the cold and wet weather was making their immune system weaker. And we know that scientifically as a, as a fact that happens. The result was a perfect storm that caused 50 million dead and 500 million infected. That's 33% of the world population. One in three people in the world got the Spanish flu. And when one in three people get the Spanish flu and documented to get a disease, likelihood is it's three in three, but we just don't, we can't prove it. Below are the figures for COVID, and that, this is not to diminish COVID, it's just to give you an idea of the scale. So we published this and it kind of skyrocketed to the top 5% of all research. 
tracked by Optometrics. And media kind of took uh, notice because guess what? People are interested in knowing how the two major crises of our lifetime are going to interact with each other and create instability in political systems, in our economy, in our financial systems. It's the big deal, right? And we want to prevent that. Climate change is instability, essentially, and uh, pandemics are also instabilities, as you know, and the two of them have caused a lot of trouble lately. So how does climate affect things? Well, it changes migration patterns, migrations that are happening all around us, just like in the case I just showed you. And each of those migrations, each of those animals and people that migrate because of climate change, because of the changes in the availability of water and food, is carrying their own diseases. And so as they carry their own diseases, they change the disease environment around us, the diseases we are exposed to. In fact, it turns out for the last 2,000 years, we've changed that disease environment and created epidemics by deforestation, removing habitat for animals, reduction of wildlife habitat in general, animal domestication, reducing the gap between us and animals. Diseases from animals can infect us. It's called zoonosis. It happens all the time. Wildlife trade, we not only take the animals from the wild, but we also eat them sometimes with all their diseases. And if you take anything else, nothing else from uh, my talk today, remember this, the one thing we can do, the easiest thing we can do to prevent the next pandemic is to ban wildlife trade right now. It's the one thing we can do. It's not hard. It's not a big business. It's a big business for just very few cruel people. And, it, and most of it is legal. And man-made climate change, we have to address that too. And that's a lot harder. But all the diseases you see on the screen are all diseases that come from animals, and they're epidemics that are ongoing, and the orange ones are really, really increasing. Here are a couple of examples. Lyme disease is right in the backyard in northeastern United States. The map shows you how much warmer the climate has gotten in the last 30 years compared to the 30 years before. And that's where Lyme disease cases have increased. And that's because by warming the climate, we doubled the length of the summer, essentially. It was 72 degrees a couple of days ago. It's November. We doubled the length of the summer, so ticks can reproduce twice as long. And guess what else? We've also killed all the top predators, so there are a lot more deer, which are the favorite food of ticks. So we made it a paradise for ticks, but a hell for us because we can't go in the woods or in our backyards in some places. This has happened also with other vectors, other d diseases, chikungunya, dengue, Zika viruses. You've all heard about these occasionally. They used to be only tropical diseases, but two species of mosquitoes carried them and their range has increased all the way to Maine, including New York City and Boston. So, why haven't we solved this? Because in most science, not to mention most businesses and policy, is really based on a cause and effect linear type of thinking. And we think, okay, we fix one cause, we'll fix the problem. In reality, that's not the case. Because reality has lots of causes all the time influencing each other and influencing an effect. And each of those causes comes from climate science, say, you know, hydrology for rain or temperature or humidity or, uh, you know, even economics and finance and policy. All of these things affect reality at any given time. And I have a PhD in a few of these things, but not all of them. So I'm going to need your help. And this is what we're doing in News Center, where we're bringing the very best scientists with the very best discoveries to solve these problems and provide actionable solutions. And the one thing that we got to do is communicate those solutions to the public and the media in a more effective way, because most science is unknown to most people. It's behind paywalls. It's uh, hidden on stacks that nobody's ever going to see, book stacks. That's why communications is there, and that's why I'm here today. As we try to solve these problems, the side effect is that we understand also the complexity of nature, all those causes, all these interactions constantly happening. And that complexity really humbles us to understand that for this, the longest time, we've actually 
deluded ourselves into thinking that we can master nature. That's what certain cultures, including our dominant culture, tells us. And in fact, we can't. We're just, just barely grasping it with big data and lots of computers and lots of really smart people from multiple disciplines, which we were going to do. But um, in fact, if you reduce nature to a tree, if you think of nature as a tree, you know, today we think, oh, it's worth the wood or it's worth a carbon offset if you're in the 21st century, right? Everybody's worried about carbon offsets today. Uh, how much carbon can this tree capture? Turns out that tree is also a habitat for certain animals that if that tree weren't there, would be in your backyards and maybe they carry diseases you don't want, right? And that disease, that, that, um, that tree is also connected to a forest through a mycelium network and it creates all sorts of other chemicals and uh, vapors and uh, water vapor and shade, which all provide shelter for not, us, not only us, but other animals. And so we actually start grasping the complexity of nature and the value of nature in a way that we never did before. But we do grasp it instinctively. Because during the pandemic, when people couldn't go to work and they couldn't buy food, they had it delivered. And they couldn't go shop for things that they didn't need. The one place they kept going to was nature. And if you lived in a big city, like I did, I lived in New York City at Central Park across the street. This is Google tracking you all. That's happening right now. <laughs> yeah, he thought there was privacy, no more. Um, if you lived in a big city, you know that the park was your lifeline, right? Nature was your lifeline. So in fact, we understand that value instinctively. So if we can understand that value in finding the solutions to climate change and future pandemics and all that instability that they bring, and we actually find solutions for nature and the ecosystem rather than just us, which is what we've been doing. Uh, sustainability cannot be just another word to keep doing the wrong thing. Got to find solutions for nature, for the ecosystem. Then nature will take care of us because nature's been around a lot longer than us and we evolved in it. So that's why I need your help, and I hope you'll join me. Take care. Mm -hmm.